All right, we are live. Um, welcome, guys, today to, to uh, today's special edition uh, Product School Talk. Today we'll be live for a full hour with our guests. So if you want to join us for the Q and A, uh, make sure you stick around. Uh, this is um, welcome, guys, today to to uh, today's special edition. Uh, Pause that. <laughs> um, this is hosted by Product School. We teach product management courses, uh, coding, and data at our six campuses. So you can find more information on that at productschool.com. Our special guest today is the product management team lead at Google Germany, hailing from Australia. And um, for the last four years, he's worked as a PM at Google in Sydney, London, and Munich. Um, so I'd like to welcome Ganesh Shankar. Welcome to. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing today? Yeah, good, thank you. Good. Awesome. I'm really happy to have you here with us today. Um, I, I'd love for you to tell us more in your background, but I know you have a presentation um, prepared for us. Yeah, yeah, I cover it in like slide two. So, so. <laughs> Perfect. So I'll let you get that set up. And um, while he's setting that up, just to remind you guys at the end of his presentation, um, we'll open the floor for Q&A. So you'll be able to drop in your questions right next to the YouTube video. Okay, can you see my screen? We can. It looks great. All right, excellent. Uh, cool. All right, I'll take it away then. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, design sprints, which is actually one of my favorite topics. Um, before we do that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so yeah, uh, as Cassandra mentioned, I'm Ganesh. I'm a product manager here at Google in Munich in Germany. Uh, so a bit of history. I started off actually as, a, as an engineer, I guess as a lot of PMs do. Uh, way back when, I started off doing like biomedical, medical hardware engineering. Uh, but straight out of university, uh, working on medical hardware, I found uh, it to be incredibly boring uh, and uh, very slow. So I kind of escaped that and uh, decided to get into software development because things happen a lot faster there. Uh, so one thing led to another, and I was working on a couple of uh, sort of online education startups uh, and eventually found my way into Google uh, in Sydney. Uh, so I've been at Google about four years. Uh, I've worked across a few teams there. The Google Drive team in Sydney, uh, a social impact team in London, which I'll actually talk a little bit about today. Uh, and then now I'm working for a group called Corporate Engineering in Munich. Uh, so we're a little bit like a internally focused R&D team. We, we basically hack on Googlers. We, uh, we try and make Googlers happier and more productive. Uh, so we're always experimenting to see what ways uh, we can do that. Uh, and that's actually why we, we use design sprints a lot. Uh, so Let's talk a bit about design sprints then. Uh, so design sprints, are I've been using them uh, as a PM and even prior to product management days in startup days as a way to sort of really rapidly prototype and, and validate uh, and test your assumptions uh, with users. So uh, to think about design sprints a bit, we, we want to know where it comes from. Uh, so design sprints were the phrase and the, the methodology, which is what it is, was kind of created at Google Ventures so if you don't know who Google Ventures are, they are a uh, sort of a venture capitalist arm of Alphabet now, uh, formerly Google. Uh, and they basically invest in early stage startups. But they don't just invest money. They actually invest sort of design and engineering and, and product knowledge in there too. So working a lot with these early stage startups across a lot of different areas, everything from hardware to coffee shops and so on, they came up with this process uh, that they use to kickstart companies. Uh, and they call it the sprint process. Uh, so they, they came up with it. Uh, they've recently published this book. Uh, if you haven't actually read the book, I would really recommend having a look at it. It's actually a bit thinner than what it appears to be there. Uh, so it's a, it's a quick read. So even though design sprints are a methodology to, uh, that is somewhat of a new phrase or has been around for the last few years, it's based actually on a lot of things that you might already be familiar with. Uh, so it takes the best elements in some cases of things like brainstorming, innovation workshops, hackathons and ideation sessions, and tries to turn it into something that uh, gives you a really tangible out outcome at the end of it. So the key to a design sprint is uh, in its name. Uh, it's all about designing and, and doing that fast. Uh, so that's the summary. Uh, but what you actually get out of a design sprint is this superpower opportunity to travel into the future and understand how users understand your product. Uh, which is uh, kind of crazy when you think about it, but uh, when I explain how a design sprint works, you'll understand. So normally when you're developing new products, you follow kind of a, a process like this. You start with an idea, you, you go off, uh, you build it, uh, you go through whatever hoops you need to do to launch it and get it out to users, uh, and then you learn something, right? Uh, because when people encounter your product, uh, they might use it in very different ways than what you thought they would. Uh, 
Uh, so a design sprint is all about having this shortcut between the idea uh, and the learning uh, and skipping the really expensive part of building and launching as well, because that can take you weeks to months. Uh, so on average, they say that the five days of investment you put into a design sprint is sort of like four to six weeks of engineering and product development time. And you're learning uh, stuff that it would have taken you uh, that amount of time to learn otherwise. So what do you get out of a design sprint? And how is it different from some of the other uh, uh, types of design thinking I talked about earlier? So in a design sprint, you actually make tangible solutions. So things that users can interact with. So you're getting artifacts out of it. Uh, and you test them in context. So you take these artifacts and you test them with real users who represent the people you want to sell or, or give your product to in future. And the final thing is that you involve the entire team. <clears throat> so you actually get your whole team together or representatives of all your team uh, in a room, which means that everybody gets aligned on the vision uh, very quickly. And yes, the last bit about you do all of this very quickly. So when is it a good time to, to do a design sprint? So there's a few times. Uh, a design sprint can be and often is used at the very beginning of a project. Uh, so when you're trying to figure out what product you want to build, uh, and also when you're kicking off a new team and you want the team to be aligned about what they're building and why. Second time it can be used is uh, if, you, if you've kind of hit a, a rut in the road, you're, you're kind of stuck, or you feel like you've been developing a product for a while, but you're not really making progress, that's a really great time to, to deploy a design sprint as well. And thirdly, it's, it's just a way of getting things done really quickly. So I talked about the speed uh, gain. So you can learn uh, real things from real users you know, within, within five days as opposed to taking weeks uh, to months to do so. So that's another time if you need to, do so, if you need to get some information from your user group really quickly, uh, a design sprint is a good way to do that. So who do you want a design sprint? Because the composition of the team you put in a design sprint uh, is uh, really important. Uh, and what you want is a, a team that's diverse and it contains all the roles working on the product. Now, here I've got an example of what a typical technology team might look like, say, at a company like Google. So PM engineer, designer, researcher, and then maybe some stakeholders. Uh, but you know, depending what kind of uh, company or product you're working on, you might have people like you know, clinicians, logisticians, and I'll talk about that a bit when we had a, a very different mixed team uh, in another time at Google. Uh, most importantly, there's this person called a sprint master, and there's a line in between everybody else and them because your sprint master, uh, they're actually independent from the team and they're really just helping you run the sprint. Uh, they're there to kind of run the process. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more when we talk about how you run a sprint. Uh, but they're basically the person with the plan who's gonna keep everybody, uh, you know, making progress. So let's talk a little bit about how we sprint. Um, a lot of this is outlined in, in the book and also some resources in the Google Ventures website and uh, the Google Design website. Uh, but I'll, talk, uh, I'll give you an impression for those who aren't familiar with the design sprint process, what it is. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about is different from the book as well because uh, design sprints, you can actually modify the process and the, the kind of activities you do quite a bit, so. So design sprints themselves, they're based around this, uh, what makes them different from things like brainstorming and hackathons and so on. They're based around this model of uh, you have this diverging and converging kind of thinking. Uh, so rather than everybody sitting in a room shouting out ideas uh, like you might do in a brainstorming where not only the loudest, uh, most charismatic person will win out, uh, or you know, isolated work like you might do in a hackathon where it's really about coding skill or like you know individual design skill. Uh, design sprint goes through this process where you work individually and then you work together and then you work individually and you work together. So uh, you get the benefits of both. Uh, and it goes through several stages. Uh, in the beginning, there's understanding uh, what your problem area is like. Uh, then you have defining or really picking the problem that you kind of want to work on. Uh, then you have diverging where you have as many crazy ideas, you go bananas uh, and have as many crazy ideas as you can. Uh, and then you have the decision phase where you basically decide that, hey, this is the idea that we want to work on and we want to prototype. Then you prototype, uh, and this is where you get the tangible outcome. You, you actually build a thing that users can interact with. And the final stage, the most important stage, is you validate it with real users. They come in, they interact with your prototype, you learn from them. So out of the book, uh, a design sprint takes five days. Now I know that sounds like a lot because you know getting a group of people, maybe your entire team together for an entire week uh, uh, with no distractions. Uh, this is a no distraction, no email kind of thing. Uh, it seems like a lot of investment, but when you think about the fact that you're saving four to six weeks worth of uh, design and development time, uh, and that you know all the associated costs that go with that, and you're gonna learn something at the end that's really useful, uh, then five, five days is actually a pretty good investment. 
So let's walk through these stages uh, and talk a little bit about the exercises you do in them. So day one is all about understanding. So what you do in the understanding phase is you, you either bring in potential users to, to gather deeper knowledge about the problem space. Um, we're assuming that your product team uh, here, they all have different specialties, right? You have engineers, you have designers, you have researchers, you might have sales folks, uh, marketers, uh, who all have different understanding of what the company is doing, what users need, and so on. So you're, you're in this first day, you're trying to distribute that knowledge evenly uh, between the different roles so people actually understand uh, the problem space. Another way to do it is by having lightning talks where experts come and, and give you quick talks about a topic. So if you have an area where there's a very specialized area of knowledge, uh, I don't know, be it machine learning or a certain clinical area, uh, you invite uh, somebody to come in, give a quick lightning talk uh, so people can kind of uh, get the, the quintessential points and think about uh, what to do. During the process of listening to the lightning talks or interviewing users, you're always taking notes. And you're taking notes in this format that's called, how might we? It's a little bit uh, goofy sounding, but actually uh, it's very useful. Uh, and, and you're trying to say, you're trying to understand, you know, what opportunities exist, um, you know, consider what, what possibilities there are and, and doing it together. And uh, so, you know, a classic example of this is if a user says it's really hard to remember passwords, you might write, you know, how might we make it easier to recall passwords? Uh, so you write a bunch of these, like everybody should really have a stack of these post-it notes by the end of it of, of the how might we. Okay, so, so that would be day one. It's all about knowledge sharing. Uh, it's really just to get people thinking uh, and, and you know, get information out there. In day two, you start defining what the problem space actually is. What are these uh, pain points that your users are feeling and uh, what are the problems that they're having? So you start by taking the how might reads uh, and you basically put them on a whiteboard. So uh, people, people get up and they, they describe the how might reads that they wrote down uh, and then they stick them on a whiteboard and you, you all take turns doing this. And as you take turns doing this, you cluster these into categories. And then you will naturally kind of find some, some common themes amongst what people are thinking. Um, and, and, and these might be the things that are more interesting to, to focus on. Another exercise you can do uh, is actually write these as agile stories. Um, now, here it's all about saying, you know, as a particular type of user, I want to do such and such so that I can get a benefit out of it. This really puts you in the mindset of empathizing with your users uh, and thinking about where their pain points actually are. So uh, you take the templates and then you, you get everyone to sort of like translate these uh, once you have your clusters into user journeys and user stories. Here's another sort of alternative exercise you can do too. It's called a future press release. Uh, it's, a, it's another one uh, that seems a little bit artificial, but actually if you get into the swing of things, it makes sense. So we talked about how design sprints are about going into the future and understanding how your users use your product. Well, if you want, your, you want to go into the future, you, know, you have to take your team with you. So writing a future press release and trying to imagine a, a amazing world where you've solved these problems uh, and, and it gets your, your team into the right mindset. So then you finish sort of day two where you've kind of defined what the problems you want to focus are, or on are. So here you get to, oh, sorry, we're still in day two, my bad. Uh, and uh, you're going to do this step called diverging. Uh, so here is where we want people to think uh, really crazy, uh, you know, like beyond what you normally would do and have lots of lots and lots and lots of ideas. You want as many ideas as you can have. Um, if we were actually in a room together, I would actually get us to try and uh, think about all the ideas we could have around a, bit, a brick were. Uh, it's a good warm-up exercise as well as it, it kind of gets people thinking about, um, you know, uh, just stupid ideas, like anything goes kind of thing. And you'll find sometimes that like two stupid ideas make a brilliant idea. So you're really trying to encourage people to just be creative. So when you're doing this ideas thing, you're, you're, uh, after you, when you share them with each other, you're not going to judge each other. You're going to say yes and and try and build upon things. You try not to overthink things. You're going to go for masses, uh, not for good ideas. Uh, yes, you want to like steal and copy from each other. Uh, you don't want to think about feasibility, which can be a little bit hard when uh, if you've got a lot of engineers in the room who really want to like logic the problem out. Uh, but really, you just want to think big and worry about feasibility later. Um, and this is important. Everyone should, should participate. Um, it doesn't matter whether you feel like you have good ideas or not. Everybody actually does. Just put ideas down. So when you've got all these ideas, uh, what do you do next? Uh, we tried, like, how do you actually get this happening? 
There is a technique called a crazy eight. So basically you take an A4 piece of paper, you fold it a couple of times, and it kind of makes this natural kind of uh, uh, division into eight, eight slides. Uh, and you basically tell people that, okay, you've got eight minutes and you draw eight ideas. Uh, so it's not a storyboard, you actually draw eight different interactions, uh, what your user should be doing in what case. Uh, it encourages you to sketch very quickly, and by sketching really quickly, you actually get more the, the actual idea than really the UI that you're trying to design. Uh, so, so that's really good. Uh, and you also like force people to kind of go through several rounds of this where they, they kind of pump out as many ideas as possible. At the end of that, uh, you can share your crazy eights with the team uh, or you take a section and you go and do a solution sketch. So basically you take the sequence of ideas or the one or two that you really like the most. And individually, uh, you actually draw these out in more detail. Uh, so this actually describes the user journey and what they're doing. Um, and I can't sketch should not be an excuse. You can see evidence here on the right hand side of uh, a solution sketch that I made. Uh, and actually, it appears that as terrible as my sketching is, it's better than my handwriting. So you know, everybody can do this, and, and everyone should participate. So what happens then? You've basically got tons of ideas. You've got all these crazy eights. You've got the solution sketch. Um, and one thing you can do, uh, which we sometimes do as a modification to this step, is between day two and day three, we do the drawing twice. So you might you spend all of day two generating ideas and generating solution sketches. Uh, and then you go home and let people sleep on it. Uh, and a magical thing happens when you let people sleep on ideas. They normally come back uh, with an even better form of what they were, were working on. So in the morning of day three, it's actually normally a good practice to just try and, and do another round of crazy eights and maybe solution sketching just quickly. Uh, but day three itself is, is all about deciding. So this is deciding what are you going to build, what are you going to prototype and evaluate with your users. And uh, so now we have to make some decisions, right? And making decisions is hard. Uh, so there's some techniques to, to make making decisions easier and uh, avoid things like groupthink. Uh, one technique is to do something called dot voting. So you've got your solution sketches uh, on a whiteboard. Uh, people, uh, either they, they can go and look through each sketch silently, so it's a little bit more like secret voting and think about it, and then they place their dots. Uh, or you, you get each person to, to explain to the group what they, what they meant when they were drawing the solution sketch, what, what the user's going through, uh, and then we go through a round of voting. Uh, a way to break deadlocks is to also give people something like a super vote, so a really big sticky dot that they can, they can assign to. Um, in a sprint, uh, it goes through this a little bit in the book, uh, you should normally have someone who's kind of like a decider in the room. Uh, often that ends up being sort of the product person or uh, some kind of like subject matter expert. Um, and they can come through and actually, they might have super votes, right? So that you can actually get to the point of the CEO of your company might say, this is the problem we actually want to solve, for example. Another technique you can use, um, because dot voting can be, sometimes it can be a bit arbitrary depending on the team you're with, is to actually map out the user value versus technical difficulty. Uh, so this is where you take all the crazy ideas and then you try and figure out which are the really, truly crazy ones and which are the ones that are very impactful uh, and maybe a bit more grounded in reality. Uh, so yeah, basically two axes, technical difficulty, user value, you map them out and then you talk about it as a team and try and decide what you want to pursue. So then we get to day four. Uh, so it might seem that day three and uh, day two and day three uh, went very quickly. I mean, there were whole days and we were just talking about drawing and then deciding. Uh, but that's actually because you normally do a few rounds of it. So you would draw, maybe go through a round of deciding, then refine and draw again, and then go through a round of deciding. So, so it might seem like you're spending a lot of time on that. Actually, it goes really, really quickly. So day four is all about prototyping. It's all about building a something that users can interact with that represents the ideas that you had. So my favorite in this is actually paper prototypes. Whenever you can get away with doing it, you should do this uh, because they're very low fidelity. And by being low fidelity, they are more about the interaction than about the UI. So you're debating you know, the use case a user is having and how they're you know, getting their needs met, as opposed to debating where the button is or what color it is. Uh, so normally, for most software applications, you can do paper prototypes, uh, low fidelity. Uh, that works pretty well. Uh, it gets a bit more complicated if you're doing hardware or a very complicated interaction flow, but paper prototypes as much as possible. The next step is you can do something like a what we call working in, in quotation marks prototypes. Uh, so here again, uh, with prototypes, you got to put yourself in the mindset of trying to cheat as much as possible. Remember that you are 
you have one day to build a prototype, which really isn't very much time. Uh, so you need to be very creative and think about how you can cheat. A good example of this is if you're, if you're doing something like building a chatbot, uh, a good prototype is you basically write a script of the things the chatbot can and can't respond to, put somebody in another room and put them on chat, and then you have your users interacting with them through chat, and they will only be able to answer you know, the, the things that you gave them. So, so you think creatively, um, you know, fake it as much as possible. Uh, really, you're trying to inter show the user uh, an interaction and not you know, try, try out the whole product. If you are building physical devices, then you normally need uh, some component of the physical prototype as well. Uh, you know, if you've got a phone, someone might need to pick it up. Uh, if you've got a, a tablet that people need to carry around, <clears throat> it's good to have something for them to hold, but it may not be the tablet itself. It could be, you know, a book while they walk around trying to interact with something. Finally, you can also do something where you make more of a vision video. Uh, this is probably my least favorite prototyping uh, technique because it doesn't actually allow the user to really interact with things. But this is all about conveying the future vision where things are amazing and you solve all their problems and seeing if they can relate with it. Uh, try and make these small a couple of minutes uh, and, uh, so that you can actually uh, you know, capture the user's attention span. So then the final day is all about validation. So this is where you get users to come in uh, and actually interact with the prototypes uh, and you learn from them. Uh, so in the beginning, you normally should have set up uh, the actual user interviews. Uh, so you want to do these in usability testing style. Uh, you want to have participants booked in who represent your uh, user group. Uh, you normally want to have a room where you can have one person uh, being an interviewer uh, and basically walk, like getting them to use the prototype and, and watching what they do and walking them through it. Uh, and then while you have everybody else uh, in the sprint sort of um, paying attention to what they're doing. So in some places uh, like Google, uh, we have uh, user interview rooms set up which are, are pretty high tech sophisticated where the researcher and the interviewee can be in one room and we have a video system where everybody else can kind of uh, uh, watch what's happening and, and take notes. But it's really important that the team is there together and taking notes because different people notice different things of what works and what doesn't. Uh, if you don't have such a sophisticated setup, not everyone does, uh, you can just record the interview and then you can like analyze it later and take notes as well. Or you can just be in the room. So that does change the dynamic a little bit. If it is hard to get your users in the room or you have very particular sort of stakeholders that you need to sort of show what you're coming up with to, uh, then, yeah, you can organize something like a bit of an impromptu design review where you bring your stakeholders in or you bring an expert in, maybe the experts you had giving talks in the beginning, uh, and you get them to assess uh, some of the prototypes that you've made. Uh, user interviews are better, um, but sometimes it's not so possible. And then you're done, right? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, that is the end of the five days. Uh, and uh, it is really exhausting to run a sprint, so uh, it, it's quite a lot of work. Um, but often what happens is at the end of it, you, you've learned a lot, which is good. Uh, and you've either got a couple of, normally you've got a prototype or two that seems like it has some legs, but you've learned um, some things that users didn't really uh, gel with, or you know, some things that you wanted to investigate a bit more. Uh, or of course, you've completely disproved everything you were trying to do, uh, which is also good because you save yourself that month to month and a half of effort. Um, but often what people will do is they'll end up having a second sprint uh, very soon afterwards, but a much reduced uh, time one where you don't need to do a lot of, say, the understanding steps, for example. Uh, so that's in its essence what the book talks about when it means design sprints. Um, there's a lot more examples and, and different kind of uh, activities you can do. So uh, have a look at that. Uh, and now I'll talk a bit about a case study uh, so I can give you more grounded in reality. Uh, uh, of a project that I worked on uh, a couple of years ago. And I've chosen a project that's a little bit out there because I want to show you that design sprints can work even in sort of very challenging situations uh, and they really help. So the project was uh, a couple of years ago, um, Google and Medicine Sans Frontier worked together to develop uh, technology for use in Ebola management centers. So, and design sprints really helped us do this. Uh, to set the scene, uh, it, uh, we started this project in October, 2014. Uh, at that time, uh, Ebola was uh, spreading very rapidly. It had spread across three countries in West Africa, and we had started having spotted uh, cases in other parts of the world too. Uh, and the world was really very much in a crisis. Uh, and at this point, Medicine Sans Frontier, who were on the front lines uh, in Africa fighting Ebola, uh, reached out to Google and said, you know, we think technology can help because these Ebola management centers, um, uh, we, we, we just, they're fairly sophisticated, but fairly low tech. Uh, we think tech can help us, but we're not really sure how. Uh, can we have a look at this together? 
So we, we formed a team uh, with Medicines on Frontier, and this was an interesting team because, you know, we had technologists on one side who knew a lot about tech, uh, like Google, and, uh, and then Medicines on Frontier who know all about frontline medical response on the other side, uh, and not a lot of, like, common knowledge between the two teams. So this is, in a way, an ideal circumstance for a design sprint because we had some understanding of the problem, uh, but not really any understanding of what we wanted to do about it. So I'll walk you through the steps of the design sprint and show you how we went about this process. Doing the understanding and defining. Uh, we started with uh, research and user interviews. So we were in a very unique situation and I'm hoping I can show you how you can modify a sprint too because we were in situations where sometimes we just couldn't do the traditional sprint process. Uh, where at the time we started a project, we couldn't travel to West Africa to study in a bowl management center. Uh, we, uh, the, the situation was too risky. Our medicine software team didn't want us you know, getting in the way while they're trying to treat patients. And uh, from a safety perspective, like there was travel bans in place and a lot of people couldn't travel. So for the research and user interviews to learn about the problem space, we brought in a bunch of their staff, especially clinicians who had been to Africa and were rotating back to Europe. Uh, and uh, this included emergency doctors, epidemiologists, logisticians who set up the camps themselves. Um, and uh, we watched uh, a bunch of videos on how Ebola management centers were run. So this was how we, we shared knowledge within the team about what was happening uh, in West Africa. And what did we learn out of that? So we learned a couple of things. Uh, one is we learned about this, uh, the, the key in fighting Ebola is this thing called the Ebola management center where patients uh, are treated uh, and they're there, uh, they were about 80, 80 to 100, a couple of hundred beds in size. Uh, they had like national and also international staff. And the most interesting thing was they were separated into these things called high and low risk zones. So low risk zones would be where the clinicians would be for most of the time. And then they would don protective gear to go and visit the patients and consult with them. And they could only be in the high risk zone for a certain amount of time. That was a very interesting problem that came out of that. Uh, we also learned uh, that in an Ebola management center's high risk zone, you had to wear this personal protective equipment. Uh, and it's really hot and heavy. Uh, it's very low visibility, uh, low dexterity, and the safety limit because of um, how dangerous Ebola is and uh, how hot and heavy the, the gear was, was about 60 minutes. So clinicians could go into high risk zone for an hour, uh, and it would take them about 20 minutes to get out of this thing because uh, it's, it's quite cumbersome and you have to be very careful. Uh, so we actually brought some of the gear over, that's uh, me, uh, but the team tried it out and we uh, like would try to experiment with how it would feel and uh, what a user went through. So then we learned a bit about ex existing practices and, and here we started you know, doing our how might we. So this was the doctors in the field and the epidemiologists and so on were telling us how do centers run. Uh, and one of the core parts of it was something known as a patient management whiteboard, uh, which basically represents the current state of the center at any point. Um, and uh, yeah, so here are how about we, right? How, how do we allow the Ebola management center state to be updated instantly instead of this whiteboard you update after doing a round? Um, how do you provide information about patient numbers and state to clinicians inside the high risk zone because they basically look at the whiteboard and then go into the high risk zone and have to remember what they saw? Uh, again, with existing practices, we, we learned about this, the patient chart, which is where they record all of the, the medical information. Again, how might we capture critical patient information and transmit it quickly? Because this process was very slow. They would go and uh, consult with patients, take this down on a piece of paper, but you couldn't take the piece of paper out of the high-risk zone. You had to destroy it. So they would basically shout over a fence to another clinician on the other side of the high-risk zone, uh, what the details of what they recorded were, who would transcribe it on another piece of paper. So again, how do you get data out of the high-risk zone in a non-destructive way, in a fast way? And then we had to diverge and decide. We, we kind of think we had an understanding of some of the core problems we wanted to focus on. Uh, and, and here's where we started prototyping. So these are actual, um, you know, um, the solution sketches we came up with, um, not, not the, the post notes, but for, further from that. So after the crazy eight round, uh, we came up with a bunch of different prototypes, each person working on their own, uh, and then describing the prototype and flow to each other. And you can see some common themes here. You can also see our sketching quality is low, uh, but you can actually really convey what's happening here. Uh, there was a lot of uh, having patient records available, uh, showing what tent people were in, uh, and uh, you know even showing a map uh, if that was possible, and uh, yeah, and scanning patient information. Uh, so here we showed the solution sketches, and here was an interesting thing: we couldn't really decide. We we came up with two prototype ideas that we really wanted to do. Uh, so we did both, uh, and that's okay. Uh, you can do that in the sprint too. So when we went 
to build a prototype. We built two prototypes, uh, and we, we had to go and test them. And again, we ran into a bit of a problem when it came to validation, because as I mentioned, we couldn't travel to West Africa, uh, and we couldn't really emulate a Ebola management center in London. Uh, so what we did was we built our uh, prototypes. Uh, we did actually put people in protective gear in the office uh, and test out stuff with them. But then we also sent people over to uh, a simulation center that they had for training new clinicians in Brussels to test the prototypes in context. Uh, so, I mean, this meant that the last day of the sprint was essentially the week after, but that is actually okay. As long as you make sure the prototype testing happens uh, and it's on you as a product owner to do this, um, it's fine if you, uh, if you can get a more realistic experience by, by having it a bit later. So that, that's what we did. So how did, uh, how did the sprint help us? Well, as I talked about in the beginning, uh, you often use a sprint uh, to define your product offering and create a shared vision. When we started the project, we said, we want to build technology to help Ebola management centers, but we knew nothing about Ebola management centers, and we didn't really know what technology would help. So it was ideal for this. Uh, it allowed us to realize that we really wanted to focus on this patient chart, uh, and we ended up transforming uh, this clinician paper, paper chart on the left-hand side to this, this kind of visual UI we had in, in an application on the right-hand side. Again, uh, when we were prototyping, uh, we, we, this is the outcome of our prototyping phase, uh, testing it in Brussels in the simulation center. Uh, and we learned something really interesting, and this is why you do sprints, because uh, there are things you don't really think about uh, that you learn uh, when you're prototyping a real thing with real users, is that in that image on the left, you can see me holding the tablet in landscape mode, and we assumed that would be the orientation we would use because um, it gave you more real estate. Uh, but when we prototyped with the clinicians, uh, we saw that they were used to actually holding clipboards in their hand, and they would hold it on, along their arm. Uh, so they actually wanted to hold the tablet in portrait mode. So in the end, we ended up adding an extra handle to the tablet enclosure, uh, and we turned our app completely uh, onto the side. And this is something that we really couldn't afford to wait one month to figure out, right? So, so it was really good we figured it out quickly. So yeah, uh, the second way the sprint helped us is by uh, allowing us to make some decisions and decide on what we wanted to build very quickly. So injecting speed into our development process. Uh, I wouldn't worry about the details on this slide, but really what it shows is that we formed a team in October 2014, uh, and we were rolling out production hardware and software by March 2015. So within six months, we'd gone through several generations of hardware and software development. Uh, and the only way that was possible was uh, by starting the process with a design sprint, because we tested two prototypes. One of them did not succeed, and the other one really uh, seemed very viable. Um, and we, if you assume each one would have taken a month to a month and a half to validate, then uh, we would have been you know, halfway through this entire project uh, and we just learning what we needed to do. So it really helped us there. Uh, and that's us launching the product uh, in, and testing it out in the Bola Management Center. So, uh, now I've talked about a case study, hopefully I've convinced you that if a design sprint can work in uh, a really challenging environment like uh, in the midst of an Ebola crisis, then they can work for, for most other products too. And, uh, I've done many design sprints over the years on many different things from hardware to software to, to all kinds of like user interactions and, and yeah, I'm a real believer in this. So let's talk a little bit about tools. Like you're running a design sprint, what are some tips and tricks uh, that you can do to, to, to make them better? For starters, the room is really important. It talks about this in the, in the book as well, um, but finding the right space for a sprint uh, is probably one of the most important things you can do. A traditional conference room where you all sit around a table and look at each other is not actually great. Uh, you really want like a large room to move around, um, good natural light, great um, ventilation because you're going to be locked in there for five days. Uh, and uh, you kind of, you definitely want a couple of whiteboards. Uh, you want a bunch of post-it notes. You want a lot of paper, Sharpies. Uh, and you definitely, definitely need this thing on the right, uh, a clock of some kind, a timer, because every activity in a sprint is basically timed. Uh, and even though five days sounds like a lot, all these activities go very quickly and uh, the sprint master needs to be on top of the timing and, and chasing people to kind of complete what they're doing. Uh, and you need tape so you can stick up stuff and sticky dots so you can vote on it. And that's pretty much the, the core of what you need uh, in the room. Now, for people who haven't done design sprints before, uh, this may not be obvious, but uh, you can't be the sprint master for your own sprint. Uh, please don't try to do it, uh, especially if you're you know, the product person or a team, like you need to be in the sprint. You need to, to give 100% of yourself to it. Sprint master job is very much a process uh, running job. It's quite fun. Uh, one way we get, uh, get around this uh, at Google is that 
uh, we sprint master for each other's sprints, for example. So I would be the sprint master for somebody else's sprint and then return, they would repay the favor and be the sprint master for mine. But uh, being a sprint master is not actually very hard and uh, the book and uh, associated content online uh, explains very clearly what to do. There are checklists. So um, you can really just give it to somebody who, who is, I guess, a little bit charismatic and who can chase your team. So the second thing, five days seems like a lot, but, uh, and especially when you're trying to convince uh, stakeholders and your team that they're gonna stop doing whatever they're doing for five days and commit everything, you know, nine to five to, to doing the sprint. Um, but put it in the context of the four to six weeks of development time and associated costs you are saving. And then it doesn't seem like a lot. So it really, really is worth the investment. Now that I've told you that five days seems like a lot uh, and told you you should invest in it, I'm also gonna tell you how to reduce it to a three-day design sprint. So yes, you can compress a design sprint. Uh, we actually do that quite often here at Google um, just to get the right people in the room. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. One way is to just, uh, as you can see, we've kind of uh, brought a lot of these activities into single days. Uh, dual days. And uh, another way to do it is to actually cut off the prototyping and validation phase and uh, do that at another time in future. Uh, what you need to be very careful about there is that you actually do it because normally the, uh, at the end of your diversion decide time, everyone's very motivated uh, and it's very easy to lose steam if you say, yeah, we'll prototype next week and we'll talk to our users, you know, two weeks after that. Uh, so that's on you. If you cut your sprint down, uh, you need to be on top of making sure that the, the, the real value of it, the prototyping and the validation actually happens. I have actually seen people propose a one day design sprint model. I've never tried it. Um, it sounds scary, uh, but uh, apparently it's possible. Okay, so next thing is you need to frame the problem clearly. You need to have a goal. Uh, this is because a design sprint is not a magical thing that's gonna tell you what to do with your team. Uh, so you need to actually come into it with an actual idea of roughly what the problem space is uh, and give a clear goal to the people taking part. Uh, so here are some good examples of good and bad goals. Uh, so build technology for use in the Ebola management centers, which kind of was the problem we started with, is a terrible design sprint goal because it doesn't really anchor you in anything. So uh, normally you want to do a little bit of research before organizing a sprint uh, and the product uh, owner or manager will kind of be responsible for picking the theme. Uh, so a very clear goal is helping clinicians in the board management centers to spend more of their time when they're in the high-risk zone with patients, right? So that's very clear. You can understand where you want to focus, uh, what problems you want to try and analyze and understand. Uh, and deliverables are important too. It's good to explain to people at the beginning what you expect to get out of it. So we want to test the user flows high fidelity locks, and uh, that's, that's an easy thing to grow. So next you want to invite the right set of people. Uh, and this is important. Uh, so right set of people is not just the technology people. Uh, you really want to get a good sample of your entire organization. There is knowledge everywhere. Uh, so really try and like get folks from sales or marketing involved too, or in the case of the Ebola management project, we were getting clinicians, logisticians in there with us because we, we needed to understand what the people in the field in Ebola management centers were thinking. Okay, then you want to show, as a sprint master, you want to show examples of what people should accomplish in an exercise and tell them why it's important. So I went through a bunch of different exercises or, or kind of like activities you can do. Um, but honestly, for a lot of people, it's a little bit of a departure from your day-to-day -day job, you know, um, just saying fold your paper in a, a, a few folds and then, you know, you're going to write eight diagrams of what you think you should do. Uh, it's kind of hard to get into that mindset. So you really want to, every time you set a activity, uh, give a really clear illustration of what to do. And actually sometimes uh, run even a dry run, like the, the brick exercise, for example, to get people in the mode of thinking about it before you do the real deal. Uh, so an example here is when we were talking about writing those agile stories or jobs to be done. Uh, so we say, hey, here's your task, write, you know, write the problems of a user as a job job to be done. Uh, but you really want to give them an example that they can anchor in. Uh, so here's one where you say, when I consult a patient, I want to see their last three days of medical data and blood test results, which is how you make decisions on Ebola cases, so I can recommend a treatment plan. Uh, and that's very clear. Uh, once you kind of give that to your group, they should understand that and they should be able to go away and do it. Uh, next thing is to have a realistic time frame. So estimate how long every activity would take and then double that. Um, also, yeah, people being people, they'll only remember when the breaks are gonna be. Uh, remember that a design sprint is uh, kind of very head sound work time. You're working the whole time you're in there. So there's no emails, no laptops, no phones. Uh, as a rule, you can say, you know, 
people have to get on their laptops first sometimes. If you do that, please leave the room. Um, but that also means that when you announce uh, what's going to happen and when, and you give the agenda, people are really going to pay attention to when the next opportunity they can get on their laptop is. So uh, yeah, make sure you have a realistic time frame. Uh, bring the agenda up uh, again and again, and, and reiterate to people at the beginning and end of each day what's happening and what's happening next. Finally, believe in it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you're asking a lot from your team. Uh, and sometimes when they're not used to doing sprints, uh, you really have to motivate them that this is actually a useful, uh, a good use of their time, right? Uh, this is a great investment. So uh, you're the motivation. And even if you're not the sprint master, if you're the person who asked for the sprint to happen, the, the product manager who believes in it, uh, then uh, you should be there like motivating people. It's, it's kind of a bit of a drag if people get uh, down about a sprint. Uh, so so you, even if you're not a sprint master, you can think of yourself as the plant in the room who's like really getting people fired up about this. Now plan the whole thing rigorously, have an agenda for, for all the hours in the day, uh, but also be ready to adjust the plan if you need to. So oftentimes what we do here is um, the Sprint Master and say me or the UX designer who really asked for the Sprint to happen in the first place, uh, we get together at the beginning and the end of each day before and after the day, and we talk about how things are going, right? And we might say, hey, this group, uh, feeling a bit low energy, so we're going to, you know, we're going to adjust this and do a little bit of a different exercise instead, and, and and try and reinvigorate them. Or this particular idea, you know, we we kind of went down this path, uh, and then maybe maybe it wasn't the greatest path, so we might we might do something different. So be ready to adjust your plan and change things up as you go. Uh, being flexible is really important. I think I outlined that when I gave you the case study of the Ebola project. We had to adjust. Uh, like how we learned about uh, our users, uh, how we actually tested our things, uh, our, our prototypes uh, around the needs of the project and also the current circumstance we had. Uh, so yeah, just uh, don't try and religiously apply a sprint as it's described in the book. Uh, definitely think critically about it uh, and be flexible. Uh, yeah, make it fun. It shouldn't feel like a horrible drain. Uh, definitely allow for breaks. Uh, actually, you might specify a certain amount of breaks, but then allow for more. Uh, and yeah, give rewards, like, you know, get people excited and, and make them feel happy about what they're achieving. And the final point is to sort of learn and broaden your skill set uh, uh, with every sprint. So be experimenting with sprints. Uh, we have a really great sprint master uh, here in one of my teams. Uh, and uh, I think we've done five sprints this year and the exercises or the activities we've done in each one has been different every time. Uh, and uh, that's great because it makes sprints uh, feel cool and new every time. It also allows you to experiment and decide what activities work better with work groups with people and uh, different teams and different projects, uh, you know, have different needs. So, you know, you can, you can, you can try mixing it up. And there's a lot of information out there about different activities you can do during a sprint. Where do you learn about this stuff, right? Uh, for starters, you can look at the book. Uh, it's a really great read. Um, the book is actually new while design sprints as a concept have been out there for a while. So there's actually a lot of information on the Google Ventures site itself, including some videos that go through each day and what you need to do. Uh, Google also has um, a design sprint kit, which has like the uh, checklist you can use as a sprint master, as well as um, all the activities you can do, descriptions of that, and a lot of the information I went through. I kind of just touched on very lightly about the different phases of, the, of a sprint, but with every activity I talked about, there's probably a, a few more. So have a look at these resources uh, if you're interested and learn some more. And that is pretty much it for my talk. So I'd love to take some questions if you have them. Awesome. Thanks so much for, um, for going through all of that with us. And uh, thanks for the um, example as well. Um, I, we saw a couple questions come through, so guys, um, feel free to start typing more of them. Um, one of them was, well, you kind of touched on this a little bit. So you were talking about um, deciding the, the roles or who's going to participate in the design sprint. So um, how would you decide specifically who um, participates on site in a design sprint by like role or um, experience, et cetera? And this is coming from Michelle. Yeah, uh, okay, that's a great question. Um, so. You definitely want to get a good mix of the roles. Uh, so, you know, PM, UX, Eng, or, or other people who represent like knowledge in your company. Um, now, in the book, they talk about keeping sprints uh, quite small. I think they recommended like seven or so people. Um, especially if it's your first sprint, uh, it's good to do that. Uh, but you can actually have more people and then split into groups as well. 
um, though it takes a bit more experience as a sprint master to manage a, a, a multi-group sprint. Um, one thing you can do if you want to get more expertise in is have more people function in lightning talks and also so uh, come in at the end as an expert opinion. So if you have people, especially time poor people like CEO or CEO who don't really want to be there the whole time, uh, you bring them in for like a cameo experience, uh, you know, in the beginning and then you, you get them to come in at the end and see the results. Uh, but yeah, try and get a mix of the different roles on your team, the, the, the people who are actually going to work together to make this thing happen. Okay. Makes sense. Awesome. Um, now this next question that came through was from Miri. Um, do you have any advice on how to introduce this process? Uh, to a company with a very uh, rudimentary UX culture. Yeah, so I mean, there are there are some really good case studies out there. I mean, I gave one in the talk; uh, it was a bit out there, uh, but actually, there are, there's some really great resources on sprints and companies who've done this before. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, uh, one of the best things you can really hook into and and, and try and, and and sell to people is you're saving four to six weeks uh, or so of development time, right? Like, and that's something that and all the associated costs with that. And it's five days of, of, um, of investment. Uh, and not only are you getting the prototype and learning stuff from your users out of it, but you're kind of really getting team alignment out of it. This is, as a product manager, this to me is actually one of the biggest benefits of a sprint and why I love them so much. Uh, you're normally in a position where you have to influence uh, without authority. Uh, so rather than having to go around and like convince everybody of your great idea or you, you get together, you basically have the idea together. And at the end of the sprint, you're all convinced of it. So. Um, definitely uh, the team alignment uh, and the amount of development time you save is, is a really good way to phrase it. Right, right, absolutely. Um, well, one question I've seen a few people um, bring up as well was um, the product manager's specific role in the design sprint. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, the product manager's specific role in the design sprint is kind of the same as any, any other role in the design sprint, except you're normally the most excited person in the room by a long way. Uh, so, so this is what I said, like you try and, you, you're normally the person suggesting we should have a sprint or, or UX uh, is, uh, and then you're, you're getting a sprint master to run, but you're kind of really trying to like fire up your groups and make people excited. Uh, one thing that uh, I do find I do fairly often in sprints though, is I might do uh, a lightning talk as well. Uh, to share knowledge because as product managers, you're normally generalists, you have some understanding of the area. Uh, before the sprint, you would be working with the sprint master and probably your UX team to find participants who represent your user group, think about the problem, define that. So you kind of have some research. So normally uh, I get signed up for a lightning talk almost every time uh, about, you know, why are we doing this? Why is this important? And that's, you know, that's pretty much what product managers do, right? So right. doing it your all and, and being the most motivated person in the sprint is, is what you're up to. Awesome. Um, we have a ton more questions coming in, so I'm going to grab another one for you. Um, here, so this is from YouTube user uh, YouTube. <laughs> um, so he said, thanks, Ganesh. Uh, design sprints seem to rely heavily on decision by committee. So how do you balance soliciting input versus leading by example as the PM, especially if you're not the sprint leader? Yeah. Uh, so. They might seem that they're designed by committee, but actually there's a lot of uh, how um, uh, talk in the book about how you're trying to avoid that. So one thing that um, is talked about in the book is that you actually have a decider, uh, and a decider quite often can be the PM uh, uh, in some cases, um, or it, it's sometimes someone like the CEO uh, who might come in uh, during your decision phase and say, look, you, you present all your ideas, and they basically, you might have the dot voting where you, you kind of, get common themes and see what people are interested in, but then the decider comes in and they have the super dot, right? And they can basically say, these are the things that uh, as a company or as a team are important. So uh, depends on your team. Like I said, you, you adjust the sprint to what the team is like. Sometimes you actually want to see what people are gravitating to because you've got the experts in the room in different areas. But sometimes you actually, you're looking to get lots of ideas and then you really, you know, your, your CEO is you know paying your salary so they, they're gonna make the decision, right? So. Okay. Um, here, we have another one um, by, okay. Uh, what tools would you use to document the requirements, like user stories, or how do you keep everyone on the same page? Yeah, actually, I think I might have forgotten to uh, say this in the talk, um, but a big part of design sprint and why the room is so important is you, you generate this thing that they call a visual brain. 
So every single piece of post-it you ever take down and every drawing you make and every like solution sketch you do, uh, you have whiteboards in this big room and you, every time you, you finish an activity, you're basically presenting to the others and you're sticking it up in those converge phases. Uh, so over time, your, your room actually becomes this monstrosity of like post-its and sticky notes <laughs> and everything circled and highlighted. Um, but that's how you keep track because sometimes you might find yourself going back to an idea you had earlier to the cost uh, to analyze things. Um, so yeah, you, you keep that going the whole time you're doing the sprint. And uh, at the end, you actually have a ton of paper. Um, often what our sprint masters do here is they take that and then they, uh, they can translate that into a presentation that we can share with other teams who, who couldn't make it to the sprint. Okay, right, so you have it up for a while. Yeah, um, yeah five days, yeah. Okay. Um, awesome. Uh, this other question comes in from uh, Kapil, which is a really interesting one. Um, but when would you decide not to do a design sprint? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, like so, some of these things are fairly self evident. Um, if you are, you know, really crunched on deadline and nobody has time, so if you can't get the right people in the room, that would be a fundamental, right? You mm -hmm. really want to get the you you really want to get representation of your team uh, together and your stakeholders and you want to have users to test uh, test your product so if say you're like you know what we'll just do this design sprint with just pm and eng and we'll worry about everyone else that's probably not going to work out very well uh, that actually it goes against the principles of it another one is um, especially when you're introducing sprints to uh, an into a new place um, you kind of wait for the opportunity of when you're trying to start something new to introduce a sprint or or when people uh, have lots of opinions about something, but there's no real agreement. Uh, so you don't just like randomly throw in a sprint when you already have a team working on stuff, but you wait for the next big thing or the thing that people are disagreeing on uh, and look for those opportunities. So trying not to interrupt your, your current flow uh, unless you really need it. Okay. Do you have advice for managing disagreements during a sprint? Um, so the good thing, about a sprint is it's actually you don't really have a lot of this I mean you, you definitely have like differences of opinion uh, but because of the way it works like you go away and you work individually right you're drawing and you're writing your ideas down individually and then you discuss them as a group and then you actually have certain points where you decide uh, it actually tends to be a really great technique to manage disagreement like it gets away some disagreement and one of the one of the um, things mentioned in the book is that you should really if there are the, what they call a troublemaker in the office right someone who's really opinionated very really loud <laughs> Uh, and really like once their voice heard, they definitely should be in your sprint uh, because you want them there. You want them to kind of like uh, express all their opinions and then you want to, to kind of have the group decide and, and it's a really good way to have alignment happen. Right, so right. it's good to have that, that challenge. Okay, okay. Awesome. So, so our, our next, next question, question is from, from Olga. Olga. Um, what should you have as a result of a sprint for each participant to kickstart active development and not lose steam following a sprint? Uh, so what should you have? Uh, so the good thing is normally um, after a sprint you have prototypes, right? And you have prototypes that are evaluated and you might have more questions uh, based on what the users interacted with. Uh, so actually it's... Uh, the thing that sometimes teams struggle with is that they have these prototypes, but they, they kind of just go back to work. Uh, so they were work, working on something, they do the sprint, they have cool ideas, the prototypes, and then they don't develop them after that, they just go back to work. So what you want to do is normally have time set aside for your team to actually continue developing the prototypes. Uh, and this is where, you know, classic product management comes in, set some milestones and, 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 and try and like see where you can get it to the next stage. Uh, another thing we, uh, I talked about briefly is sometimes at the end of a sprint, you have another sprint. Uh, it's a smaller one, but basically you have prototypes, you have questions, uh, and you basically take that and generate more prototypes, and then you just go through an iterative process until you figure out what you want to build. Awesome. Okay, uh, this next question comes from Alisa. Uh, the uh, UX researcher seems to come in at the end, so do you ever have them in the beginning of the sprints to influence or help narrow down the direction that you want to take? Yeah, actually, a, a UX researcher is often um, the lightning talk uh, presenters because they have what, sometimes the best domain knowledge on an area i mean they've been doing the research uh and oftentimes we have them as a participant as well um it just depends on their availability because they're normally uh, one of the rarer roles uh, in companies um but they also have a really important uh, role in, in sort of uh, doing the interviews um of course you may not always have a ux researcher in which case you can do interviews yourself um but if you have one it's, it's very handy okay okay awesome 
Um, now this next question is from Rashmi. Uh, what advice would you give a software developer who's practiced agile scrum at work to move product to move to product management or a sprint master role? Yeah. Um, so what are my thoughts about becoming a product manager from a software engineer? I mean, I, I guess I did that transition too. Um, I think product management tends to attract a, sort of a personality type, uh, people who are really passionate about technology, but also like working with people and get bored easily. Uh, I think that's kind of like the, the subset. Um, so I would, um, the example I give, uh, say folks at Google who are interested in, in trying out product management is to uh, see if you can get like, um, uh, what we call a 20% uh, project. So uh, PMs are, are normally very thinly spread in most organizations uh, and have a lot to manage. So, so I would talk to uh, a PM or try and find a mentor uh, who might be able to like give you a portion of the project to work on uh, and try doing things like understanding user needs and, and working with engineers and set those requirements. Um, I, do, I do think that product management and being an agile sort of sprint uh, planner are, are quite different. Um, one's more on the project uh, management side and the other one is more about figuring out what are we building and why, right? That is fundamental to what a product manager does. Um, right. So yeah, so the advice uh, I give there is to sprint master as well for a sprint is, is another, another kind of skill set as well because uh, that's actually also mostly about flexibility uh, and understanding all the different techniques you can do in motivating people. So there are Two different roles that kind of tend to overlap a lot, but um, but you know, have a have a try and get an understanding of what each role requires and the type of person that works in them, and, and see if that suits you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, this, um, question this question comes, comes in from Asraf. Asraf, um, can a design sprint be longer than five days if the team is working on more than one project? Um, would you ever recommend that? Uh, I would not recommend that. It's definitely good to be focused and. Five days is exhausting. Uh, design sprints are exhausting. Like at the end of the day, you normally just want to go home and pass out. Um, they because you are basically engaging with everybody else the whole day. Uh, very rarely do we actually do that in our day to day. We normally like get distracted and go off and have chats and stuff. So uh, it, I would definitely have a break in between. Um, and if you have multiple projects, then do different sprints, but you know, interspace some time between them for sure. Absolutely. Um, now, this next question is from Kelly. Is there a place for a design sprint when you're trying to rethink a complicated or existing software um, or software product? Sorry. So how can you target your sprint when you often can't solve for everything at once? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Uh, so yes, there is place for a design sprint. That's actually one of the places for a design sprint when you're either trying to rethink or you, know, you feel like you're stuck in a rut, right? You've been working on this complicated thing and it's kind of ballooning up. Um, but what you're trying to do in the design sprint is get an understanding of the area. So you get the experts and it sounds like at that point, most people will know a lot about the complications. Uh, and then think about the problems you want to solve for users uh, and try and empathize with your users. Uh, and then, then you get to the point of like, what are you trying to build? So you're, you're not trying to come into a sprint saying, what are we trying to build? Because that's the wrong mindset. Uh, you start with the learning uh, and then you kind of diverge a bit and then you decide what you're trying to build. So uh, the process itself will, will guide you through that. Right, awesome. Um, well, we just have a couple of minutes left, guys. So I'm gonna um, bring up one other question that I saw come through, and um, and then that'll be the last uh, one or so. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, oh no! <laughs> random interview question. Um, or <laughs> we can rephrase it to: What advice would you have for aspiring product managers or those wanting to break yeah, yeah, into product yeah, okay, management? <laughs> So it's a product management uh, in general. Uh, I love the job, by the way, so I'm very happy I'm here. Uh, but it's, it's normally you need a diverse set of skills. Uh, you're generalists. Uh, so like learning a bunch of different skills, learning uh, engineering, getting out there, doing some business, um, uh, learning a, a bunch of different programming languages and so on uh, is actually really useful. It's actually really, really important to be grounded. Uh, for a lot of uh, tech product management jobs, it's really important to be grounded in, in technical roots. Uh, and then normally they'll only hire for, for people who have technical background or can demonstrate it. So uh, at one point when I was uh, first into my career, I exited the technical side and went into the business side immediately. Uh, uh, and then I, I think, uh, and that was probably the best thing I did because uh, I don't think I would have been a product manager until then. Uh, another thing is being a startup 
uh, trying to, to, to work on a startup, uh, even if it's just an idea you want to kind of try and build with your friends uh, and not really turn into like a big business, teaches you so much. So, so definitely getting out there and having that startup mentality and like hacking on stuff uh, is really important because you learn more than just about the technology, but you learn about the business side, how you sell this, what makes a successful product, the UX side, and trying to learn like all those different skills you learn. So doing the startup for me was probably where I learned all the things that eventually got honed into being a product manager. And it's where I made the transition from an engineer to sort of a PM mindset. It kind of happened without me realizing it, um, but that was probably one of the best things I did. Yeah, it's definitely something that we talk about often too, is that if you, when you want to become a product manager to um, build something. <laughs> so, so absolutely. Um, well, thanks so much for your time. Again, that's, the, that's uh, it for the Q&A and everything today. So thanks for joining us. Um, appreciate the presentation and everything. Um, and thanks everyone who joined in on the, the talk today. Um, as you guys know, we, uh, we're Product School. You can learn more about us at productschool.com. Uh, we're also on Facebook and Twitter at Product School. And we just recently uh, released our book called The Product Book, uh, which you'll see on Amazon as well. So um, thanks again, and we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. See you later. Bye.